<clears throat> All righty then. All righty then. How are we doing, folks? <clears throat> Remember, there's going to be about a five, six second delay, a lag. So we're on. All right. Good to see you guys. Nice to see you guys. <clears throat> I'm watching myself on my own YouTube channel and I'm watching the comments. So let's wait a few more minutes before we begin. Good to see every one of you. Sa and Noam, Bethy, right? DHC, Loris K, Henry, Christian Apologetics, first and last, our precious brother and Lord Jesus Christ who serves us. Christian Apologetics, Q the One, Danny McGuire, Rebel Mark, all of you. Bless you all. Welcome, the Lord Jesus. Bless you all. Jason, every one of you. Loris, <clears throat> there's a lot of you guys. In the bus from lectures to the house. <clears throat> all right, Gloria, God bless you. Father, bless you. The Son, bless you. The Holy Spirit, bless you. The One, God bless you. I kiss your eyes. All right. Okay. God bless you, Libertas. <laughs> you kiss my eyes. I wonder why. Anyway, we're going to wait a few more minutes. Just wait for people to show up. Pray for my throat, my health, in Jesus' name, my holiness, my purity. Lord, loosen my tongue. You know, I got a lisp, right? Sometimes it's very pronounced. You can see it. You can see my lisp. <laughs> Listen, Chuck Norris. In your wildest dreams, can you beat Bruce Lee? Okay? Let's not hate. Chuck Norris was a student of Bruce Lee, and Bruce Lee in his time was pound for pound the best fighter known. Glory to Jesus Christ. My angels, my two little girls, are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, sealed by the Holy Spirit, preserved in the Father's perfect love. As long as the Father preserves them, washes in the blood of Jesus, seals them by the Spirit, they're good. Anyway. I got I want you guys to thank <clears throat> first and the last because he helps me to help you by serving me and posting verses. He doesn't have to do it because he doesn't get paid to do this, right? Now the guys don't forget, May 12 to May 19, I'm going on a road trip with a pastor and several brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. Assyrian Eagle, God bless you, my fellow Assyrian, <clears throat> a brother and Jesus from my people. We're going to be going on a trip for a week, so we need your prayers, your intense prayers for traveling mercies that the Lord Jesus will protect us driving, protect us in every state we go as we preach the gospel, <clears throat> pass out tracts, and reach local Muslims, Muslims locally, and pray for the provision. If the Lord puts in your heart to want to support this trip, <clears throat> the links to my Patreon account, my PayPal account, as well as another account where you can get a tax receipt is there. The fastest way is PayPal for now. So if you guys want to support us financially we'd appreciate it i'd appreciate it because again i'm into in full-time ministry and we do this full-time for the glory of jesus christ and he provides through his people for his glory in jesus name lord willing i will be coming to la this year god willing christian apologetics actually let me let the cat out of the bag lord willing within a month or two i'm going to be doing shows with david wood and rashid rashid David Wood and I will be doing shows. And so around that time, I'll probably visit L.A., right? Just let you know. So keep praying for that in Jesus' name. <clears throat> right? So pray for that. Pray God will open more doors <clears throat> for his glory. Use me more mightily. Send me out there to glorify Christ and fill me with the Spirit, not just to preach the word, but to live the word. Preaching it is one thing, living it. Is another thing pray God will give me the power of the spirit to live holy unto the Lord Jesus to be holy like Jesus worshipful <clears throat> just praying and fasting and reading scripture I need to do a lot more of that being more zealous for our God than other groups like Muslims are for their gods and goddesses and their false prophets on that note now pastor Joseph is a wonderful wonderful brother a wonderful man of God and he's doing wonderful <clears throat> okay if you guys are ready we'll begin Part three, if you guys are ready. Alan Ruhul, how you doing, man? You were here yesterday, but you disappeared. Did you listen? Alan, did you listen to the second session? Did you listen to it thoroughly? May the Lord Jesus beatify me with his beauty for his glory and give me the power of the Holy Spirit to be holy. All right. God bless you. You too, Rebel Mark. <clears throat> I am ready. All right. Luisa. Hey, Luisa, how are you, sister? 
Okay, I'm just saying. I just want to know how long. Okay, in Jesus' name. Hello, my man. How you doing? How you doing? All right. Going to do any more videos with Al? Yes, God willing, I'll be doing more videos with Al, with David Wood, and others. Because we're a team by the grace of Jesus Christ, right? We're members of the same body, and we are interdependent. We need one another as we depend on Jesus Christ, empowering us by his spirit to glorify Christ <clears throat> and serve one another and serve you. <clears throat> okay. All righty then. Okay, we're about to begin. Alan, first and last day. I didn't see if he responded. I did have to walk home from work. I'm off work. And, okay, good. Alan, well, again, I'd like you to review my responses because i know you do write reviews for your blog and if you're up for it <clears throat> tell me what you think of my responses if you want to write something by the grace of god obviously I, I just like praise so if you criticize me i'll probably get upset come and lay hands on you just kidding okay <clears throat> if we're ready we're ready <clears throat> dcci was here but i think she left oh thank you alan praise jesus christ Everything good, everything perfect, everything that is praiseworthy is the work of the triune God, the grace of the triune God. So we give the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit all glory for everything and anything we do that is of value in the sight of God. We don't take credit. And may the Lord give us the grace to be truly humble from the heart and not to pay lip service and to have a false pretext of humbleness. May the Lord Jesus crucify our flesh, destroy our flesh, destroy my flesh, and fill us with life, power, and fruit from the Holy Spirit. With that said, let's begin. <clears throat> Let me get ready. Okay. Praise be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we need you. We depend on you. We love you. And we praise you. We glorify you. We magnify you for who you are. Not simply for what you've done for us. Even if you did nothing for us, you'd still be worthy of praise because you are God and we exist because of you and we love you, Father, for who you are, the true God. We're in love with your son, the Lord Jesus, the beloved, and we're in love with your Holy Spirit. <clears throat> you are in love with us. Give us the power to be in love with you and in love with Jesus and love with the Spirit. And Father, I ask that you <clears throat> bless this session as you did the previous sessions. Anoint us by your Spirit. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Loosen my tongue to speak truth clearly, to speak accurately. Save me from stammering and confusion and from misinterpretation, Father. Bless everyone who will listen, who is listening, with wisdom and knowledge by your Spirit and the power of your Holy Spirit to know these truths and live them out for the glory of Jesus. Give us the power to be doers of your word, to truly live for you, Father. I need that grace, please, to truly live for Jesus, to truly live for your spirit and the power of your spirit, Father. Anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants. Use my meager efforts to strengthen the household of God by the power of the Holy Spirit. Cover us by the blood of Jesus, Father. Cleanse us in the blood of Jesus. Cleanse our loved ones, my precious angels, even their mother with the blood of Jesus, Father. Save them and seal them for your glory. And Lord, give me the health I need and the energy I need and the strength I need to glorify you. Strengthen my lungs, my chest, and my throat. <clears throat> For your glory. We need you, Father. We love you. We need you, Lord Jesus. We love you. We need you, Holy Spirit. We love you. Holy Spirit, take over for the glory of Christ in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Amen. Like I said, welcome, Tatiana. Like I said, I have a lisp. I try to cover it up, but for some reason in these shows, my lisp has been more pronounced. You can see it. Thucker and thuckatat. That's why. When I have Bible studies locally, the people that sit in the front row, they get showered by my holy saliva. After all, every part of us has been sanctified. So even our saliva is sanctified. So I'm going to shower my screen with holy saliva, right? It's amazing how the camera can make you look bigger or smaller. And this camera makes me look bigger. I'm actually one gorgeous beast. Arr! No, I'm just kidding. Are we ready to continue where we left off from yesterday? <clears throat> As the Lord Jesus gives me unction to speak clearly and recall the information for his glory. Are you guys ready? <clears throat> Let me again briefly touch on, touch on John 17. Do you remember one of the proof texts that Adnan Rashid used against James White in his debate to prove that Jesus Christ worshiped a unipersonal God? One of the proof texts was John 17, 3, where Jesus says the Father is the only true God. We've already unpacked 
pretty much the meat of that passage. But I do want to touch up on it, <clears throat> a few more issues, and then we'll segue into the other passage. The other passage he used was John 8, 53. I'm sorry, John 8, 54, not 53. <clears throat> John 8, 53 is the Jews asking him, who does he think he is? Who does he make himself out to be? The other passage he used was John 8, 54. <clears throat> let's, let's look at John 17, 3 again. I'm not going to go over the stuff I already discussed in depth in the previous session. It's archived. It's been preserved on my YouTube page. May the Lord Jesus use it <clears throat> so that people will come and listen to it. I just want to look at John 17, 3 now in light of John 17, 5, because John 17, 5 will be the segue into John chapter 8, verse 54. You said White had a good answer for John 8 in his, in your opinion. Well, it's going to get much better because, now, Alan, stick around. I'm going to show you how much meat there is in John 8. It's mind-boggling. <clears throat> yeah, that's right. Okay, John 17, 3 says, this is life eternal. Guys, focus with me. What I want you to do is keep focused on the discussion. Don't let the enemy distract you with side talk in the comment section. And keep your questions relevant to the discussion because I want you to learn this information. I want you to absorb this information, apply it for the glory of Jesus Christ, multiply it by spreading it, right? Okay. And this is life eternal, eternal life, <clears throat> that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I already demonstrated contextually in light of verses 1 and 2 and 20 to 23, specifically verse 23, that Jesus Christ cl claims to be essentially one with the only true God. The only true God is the Father of Lord of our Lord Jesus Christ, and Jesus claims to be one in essence with the only true God. Well, if he's one in essence with the only true God, that means he has to be the true God as well. <clears throat> so I already discussed that. But now let's look at, <clears throat> sorry, I gotta move the, move the thing a little bit. Now let's look at John 17, verse five. This is what James White usually quotes to try to prove that in the context, our Lord is not denying his deity. And John 17, 5 is powerful, but you make John 17, 5 all the more powerful when you read it in light of verses 1 and 2. Don't just go from John 17, 3 to verse 5. Look at verses 1 and 2 as we did, and then use verse 5 along with verse 23 and the other passages in John that fully expound and elaborate on the fact that our Lord Jesus Christ in this chapter is claiming to be essentially one <clears throat> with the Father. He's not the same person as the Father. He's personally distinct from the Father. He's the Father's Son who became flesh to be the Father's servant. But he's one in essence and ability and characteristics and glory with the Father. Let's look at John 17, 5. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, doesn't matter right now. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world ex existed. And now, Father, glorif glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So notice what our Lord just stated. Jesus claims to have shared in the same glory <clears throat> that belongs to the Father before the creation of the world. I was with you, I was personally with you before the world was and sharing the same glory alongside of you before the world was. Did you catch it? Before the world was created, I, the Son, Jesus Christ, existed alongside of you, <clears throat> alongside of you, don't forget that, in your presence, <clears throat> alongside of you, and the same glory, the glory you have was mine because I was there side by side with you, alongside of you, in the same glory before the world was. Now, how is John 17, 5 at all compatible with Islamic monotheism, or I should say Islamic Unitarianism? Which Muslim would accept that Jesus Christ, our Lord, in John 17, 5, personally existed before he became flesh, before the world was created, in the very presence of the Father, side by side with the Father, in the very glory of the Father? Which Muslim would affirm that? Which Muslim can believe that? <clears throat> no one, right? So now, 
let's tie in Isaiah 48 verse 11 because I'm going to use this to segue into John 8 54 because I can't understand for the life of me how again Adnan Rashid and Hashem Hashem who's another member of the Dawa team that DCCI often debate <clears throat> because there's a Q&A section to the debate I didn't link to it in the description box but in the Q&A section Hashem brings up Isaiah 42 verse 8 but we're going to look at Isaiah 48 11 to try to prove that the glory that Jesus would be given cannot be the glory of Jehovah. <clears throat> Let's read Isaiah 48, 11. Guys, make sure you're getting the argument. If you're not, let me know in the context and the text saying, look, I'm not getting it. Can you repeat yourself? Because I don't mind repeating myself because I'm here to serve you. I want you to understand it. Notice what Isaiah 48, 11 says. For mine own sake, even for mine own sake, will I do it. For how should my name be polluted? I will not give my glory unto another. So here Jehovah says, the glory I possess, I will not give to someone else. I will not give my glory, the divine glory that belongs to Jehovah, to another. <clears throat> right? With me there? But our Lord Jesus says in John 17, 5, he existed with the Father, side by side with the Father, next to the Father in the very same glory. If Jesus is a creature, then he now blasphemed the true God and usurped the glory of the true God by ascribing to himself a glory that the true God says he will not give to another. And since Jesus is not a blasphemer, and the proof of it is <clears throat> he was raised from the dead, immortal, never to die again, in vindication of his claims, this means that Jesus can't be a mere creature. Because a mere creature cannot exist with God in the very glory that belongs to God alone before the creation of the world. <clears throat> so it's not that simply Jesus existed before the world was created. Because even angels existed before the world was created. Jesus is claiming more than that. Not only did I personally actually exist before the world was created, I personally actually existed with the Father in the same glory. I and the Father existed side by side in the same glory. With me there? So it's not simply that he existed before the world was, because even angelic creatures existed before the world was. He existed with the Father in the same glory that the Father possesses, something no creature can say. So focus, by the grace of God, on the point. Now. How did Hashem, Adnan Rashid's crony, fellow Mohammedan, respond to that? And how did Adnan Rashid respond to that? Are you ready now? Yes. It really disturbs me when you have someone asking me, are you sure that angels existed before the world? What do you think the world is in John 17, 5? Because I can't pronounce your name. It's a Russian name. You know who you are. According to John, the world is not the heavens and the earth. The world is the earth. So stop splitting hairs because what you call earth is what John calls the world. Do you want me to prove it to you? Sorry that I have to be forthright and forceful with some of you. Can I prove to you that the world does not include the heavens where angels dwell, but it refers to the earth? Because an objection was raised. Are you sure that angels existed before the world? Absolutely. Are you sure? Let me prove it to you. John 6, 38. Okay. Please don't ask me questions that will get me off topic. But I do appreciate this question because many people ignorantly, naively think the world means heaven and earth. No. John 6, 38. Pay attention because you brought up the objection. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. I came down from heaven. All right. Notice heaven. In contrast to the world, John 16, 27, 28. John 16, 27, 28. Captain Ron, what do you mean be forceful? That's that he got upset with me, man. And I thought you're going to block me. I love you, brother. I hope I didn't offend you too much. But bear with me because this is how I teach. Sometimes I'm very harsh. Forgive me. But you were very upset with me. So thank God you're back. For the Father himself loveth you because you have loved me and I believe that I came out from God. 
I came forth from the Father and came into the world. So my friend, how could Jesus have come from the Father into the world, come down from heaven, from the Father into the world, if the world includes heaven itself? Can you explain that to me? Go ahead, because you brought up the Egyptian. Are you sure the world, the angels existed before the world? Yes, I'm sure, because Jesus said he came down from heaven, from the Father, into the world. If the world includes heaven, then Jesus did not enter the world. He was already in the world, if that term world includes heaven itself. By the way, Pavel, we don't need to talk about that later. Because you just got your answer, right? Did everyone understand? The world in John isn't heavens and earth. The world in John is the earth that Jesus entered from heaven from the Father. <clears throat> is that clear? I just want to make sure everyone got it. And by the way, sorry for the poor lighting, because this is the only place I can live stream. Lord willing, we'll find a better location with better lighting. But hey, it's not about the lighting. It's not about the professional <clears throat> professionalism. It's about the content. Okay. So now, when Jesus says he existed before the world was created, that could be said of angels. That could be said of angels, right? Because the world in John means the earth. And we know from Job 38, verses 4 to 7, the sons of God, the angelic host, were there when God created the earth. Were there when God created the earth. So to have Jesus say that he was there before the world was created doesn't mean he's God. Even Job's witnesses believe, John 17, 5. Even Job's witnesses believe that Jesus existed before the world was created, but they believe he's the archangel Michael, the first of God's creation. So then what part of John 17, 5 proves that Jesus is claim, claiming divine pre-existence? Pre-existence meaning before he existed as a man. Pre-human existence, existence. Jesus personally existed even before he became man. What part of John 17 shows that he existed as God in heaven before he became man? Not the part that he says he was with the Father before the world was created. Because even Michael and Gabriel, right? Michael and Gabriel existed with God before the world was created. So what part of Jesus' words show that Jesus existed as God, one with the Father? He didn't exist as the Father, but as the Son who is equal to the Father in essence before the creation of the world. What in John 17 shows that? No, you guys are not listening. Why are you going to John 1 and John 8, 58 when that's not the passage we're addressing? If you can't prove your point from a passage you're quoting, don't quote the passage. Billy Mandalay got it. The glory I had with you. The glory I had with you. Thank you. It's not simply that he existed before the world was created. He existed side by side with the Father in the very glory that the Father possessed. Something that cannot be said of an angelic creature. Do you understand now? Is that clear? Before I move on, I'm going to be very slow because I want to make sure you're getting it. Is that clear? Okay, let's look at Isaiah 48, 11 again. So, Pavel, did it make sense now? Don't ever assume world in John means heavens and earth. It means the earth that Jesus entered into by coming down from heaven from the Father's presence. Okay, Isaiah 48, 11. <clears throat> okay. For mine own sake, even for mine own sake, will I do it. For how should my name be polluted, and I will not give my glory unto another? So if Jesus is not Jehovah, then Jesus blasphemed Jehovah by saying that I existed side by side with Jehovah in the very glory of Jehovah. Because Jehovah says that's a glory he doesn't give to a creature. 
First last, Salman is not here to listen. Ignore him. Block him. Okay? So how could Jesus say that he existed side by side alongside of the Father and the very glory that the Father possesses before the world was created if he's a creature? The answer is he's no mere creature. That's the point of John 17, 5. Jesus is showing that he is truly God, essentially one with the Father, possessing the very divine nature of the Father, which is why he shares the very glory of the Father, because he's one with the Father in essence. That's the point. And that was confirmed by John 17, verses 1 to 2, where our Lord says, the Father glorifies the Son the way the Son glorifies the Father. The Father glorifies the Son in the way the Son glorifies the Father. And the Son says, glorify me so that I can glorify you. And the Son gives eternal life to all that God gives him. An explicit claim to deity that Jesus is God in the flesh. Okay, now, now how did Adnan Rashid and Hashem respond to that? Well, in the Q&A, Hashem cited Isaiah 42, 8 with... <clears throat> Adnan citing Isaiah 63, 16 and John 8, 54 to prove that the Father alone is Jehovah God so that the Father could not be giving, giving, uh, could not be giving Jesus the glory of Jehovah because the Father alone is Jehovah. What do I mean? Hashem quoted Isaiah 42, verse 8, where it says, I will not give my glory to another. Adnan then came back and said, in Isaiah 63, 16, Yahweh, Yahovah, Jehovah is the Father. Let's go to Isaiah 63, 16. No, Tony, I can't because the discussion is not on the angel of the Lord. Isaiah 63, 16. Doubtless thou art our father, though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us not. Thou, O Lord, Jehovah, art our father, our redeemer. Thy name is from everlasting. See, Jehovah is our father. And then in John 8, 54. <clears throat> watch here. John 8, 54. So now watch how this is going to backfire against Adnan and Hashem. And I hope DCCI is listening because, Hatun, you need to use these arguments to send them to early retirement. They have no business debating according to scriptures. Okay. John 8, 54. John 8, 54. Okay. Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me, of whom ye say, say that he is your God. Did you catch it? Adnan quoted this passage say, see, Jesus recognized and acknowledged that for the Jews, the Father is God. Therefore, since Isaiah 63 says Jehovah is Israel's Father, and since Jesus confirms that the Jews are right, that the Father is their God, this means that the glory of Jehovah is the glory that belongs to the Father alone. And since Jesus is not the Father, therefore he can't be Jehovah, Therefore, the glory that he was talking about cannot be the glory that Jehovah says belongs to him alone. You understand the argument? You understand what he's trying to prove? The Father alone is Jehovah. Isaiah 63, 16 confirms that. Jesus also confirms that John 8, 54. Since Jehovah does not give his glory to another, and the Father alone is Jehovah, that means Jesus could not be given the glory of Jehovah. Do you understand his objection? Before I move on, I want you to catch his objection. Now, <clears throat> first and last, he didn't use the King James. He used a translation other than the King James that said, my father who glorifies me. Can you look at the ESV and cite the ESV? Because now I'm going to show you how it backfires against him. Watch here. He cited the translation where it says, my father, whom you say is your God, is the one who glorifies me. I don't know if he was citing NIV. I think he was citing New American Standard Bible. Yeah, John 8, 54. But wait, wait, wait. And so watch how it's going to backfire against him. Watch here. Okay. Yep, this is the one. Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. 
If you go back and listen to Q&A, he quotes the translation that says this, glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father glorifies me of whom you say he is our God. Did you catch how this very verse which he cited ended up burying him without him seeing, without him realizing it? He quoted this verse to show that Jesus acknowledged that Israel's God is the father. And since the father alone is Jehovah, Jesus could not be given the glory of Jehovah. Did you see how John 8, 54 just decimated him? You guys don't see it, right? How can you quote John 8, 54 to prove the Father alone is Jehovah God, according to Jesus, and therefore Jesus does not receive, is not given the glory of Jehovah, when that's the very verse that Jesus says, it's the Father who glorifies me. Hello? Wait. You're quoting a verse where the God of the Jews is the very father that glorifies Jesus? You're kidding me. This is the verse you're quoting to prove that Jesus doesn't possess the glory of Jehovah because the father alone is Jehovah? Because Jesus acknowledged my father is your God. The very verse where Jesus says, my father whom you say is your God is the one who glorifies me. So that Jehovah God the father glorifies his son. Cue the, the one. Did you catch it? Adnan quoted John 8, 54 to prove. See, Jesus says, my father is your God, the God of the Jews. And therefore, if he's the God of the Jews, the Father alone is Jehovah. And the Father alone possesses the glory of Jehovah. That's the very verse that Jesus says, my Father, whom you claim is your God, is the one who glorifies me. I don't need to glorify myself. He glorifies me. He does it for me. My Father does the job for me. My Father is in the business of glorifying me. You're telling me a creature can speak that way. A creature can go up to the Jews and say, hey, guys, there's no need for me to glorify myself. God himself glorifies me. That's the passage that Adnan cited to try to prove Jesus isn't Jehovah. Can you believe it? Can you believe that? I mean, I want it to sink in. That's why I'm giving you guys a couple of minutes. How can Adnan quote John 8, 54 to prove that the Father alone is Israel's God? Therefore, the Father alone is Jehovah. When that's that very passage where Jesus says, my Father, whom you claim is your God, he's about glorifying me. I don't need to glorify myself. The Father is the one who glorifies me. He does it for me. Okay. Can you imagine Moses saying that? Muhammad saying that? Alan Rule, did you catch it? DCCI, did you catch that? It's not they cannot read. They're blinded by their father, the devil. The same father who possessed Muhammad, controlled Muhammad, and influenced Muhammad to be an antichrist to pervert the gospel. But we pray in Jesus' name, by the power of the Spirit, he sets them free from the influence of this evil spirit that possessed Muhammad and gives them eyes to see and ears to hear. Let's read it again, John 8, 54. Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. See the one that you say he's your God? That's my Father. And it's my Father who glorifies me, so I don't need to glorify myself. Let alone the fact that the true God is the Father, which Muhammad's God isn't. Did you catch it again? In Isaiah 63, 16, Jehovah is the Father of Israel. And in John 8, 54, Israel's God is Jesus' Father, his very Father who glorifies him, all of which the Quran denies. Because in cha chapter 5, verse 18 of the Quran, the Jews and Christians told Muhammad, we are the sons of Allah and his beloved. And Muhammad said, no way, you're not. You're not the children of Allah. You're not his beloved. And in chapter 9, verse 30, Muhammad says, Allah will fight and curse and kill the Messiah. The Christians were saying that the Messiah is the son.
And in Isaiah 63, 16, which had not cited, Israel says, Jehovah is our father. And in John 8, 54, Jesus says, your God is my father who glorifies me. You see how easy it is to destroy Islam? You see how easy it is to destroy Muhammad and expose him as a false prophet who's under the glorious feet of Jesus? And how easy it is to proclaim the truth of Jesus if we yield to the Spirit, study our scriptures, and ask the Spirit to give us the power to understand the word and apply it for the glory of Christ? You catch it? Is that clear? Now let's go to John 8 and see what kind of nightmare John 8 poses. No, Melchizedek was in Jesus. Guys, focus on the topic. Keep your questions related to the topic. Don't ask me about the angel of the Lord. That's not the topic, right? Okay. Now let me show you how John 8 destroys Islam further and exposes Adnan as a charlatan, as a deceitful, dishonest charlatan. I have no respect for him because if he's read John 8, 54, then he's read John 8. Right? So I have no respect for someone who perverts my scriptures to shame and humiliation. All right. Now, let me, let's unpack John 8. Are you ready? Let's go to John 8, 39 to 40. John 8, 39 to 40. John 8, 39 to 40. Guys, follow with me. I'm going to use the very chapter of John 8 that Adnan used to prove that Jesus and Muslims are similar. And that they worship a unipersonal God. Pay attention here. Our Lord speaking to the Jews. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Watch what Jesus says. Jesus saith unto them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Did you catch what he says? If you were Abraham's children, you would act like Abraham. But here I'm going to prove to you that you don't, you're not truly Abraham's children. Physically you descend from him. But spiritually, you don't belong to him. You know why? Because you're trying to kill me. A man who's told you the truth, he's heard from God, from the Father. This Abraham did not do. Post John 8, 40 again. John 8, 40 again. Okay. Can we send Damien to Hades? What a, what a, what a na name, Damien. He's trying to mock. Get rid of this guy. Can you block this guy? I don't want him on my channel. Let's read John 8, 40, guys. Read. You seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Did you catch what he's doing here? He's saying, you Jews don't belong to Abraham because you're trying to kill me, a man who's told you the truth I heard from God. Abraham didn't try to do this. Did you catch it? Did you catch what Jesus said? Abraham did not do what you're trying to do. You're trying to kill me. Abraham did not do that, proving you don't belong to Abraham. Guys, get it. You got to get this point. You're trying to kill me. Abraham didn't try to do that. So you have nothing to do with him. Abraham didn't try to do what? Abraham didn't try to do what? You Jews have nothing to do with Abraham because you're trying to kill me, a man who told you the truth that he heard from God. Abraham didn't try to do this. So for the rest of you, what didn't Abraham do that the Jews were doing? Yeah, kill him. Hold on, folks. Abraham had been dead for 2,000 years. How could Jesus say... Abraham did not try to kill me like you are. No, and Jesus is not Melchizedek. Folks, stop it. He's not Melchizedek. Stop, Pavel. He's not Melchizedek. Does that make sense? A man who's been dead for 2,000 years didn't try to kill Jesus? What does that assume? What does that assume? Abraham did not try to kill me, but he's been dead for 2,000 years. What does that assume? It assumes that Jesus and Abraham met 
And when Abraham met Jesus, his reaction was different from the Jews of Jesus's day. Let's look at John 8, 56 to 59. You got it. John 8, 56 to 59. No, Pavel, why are you bringing Melchizedek into discussion when Melchizedek has nothing to do with Abraham trying to kill Jesus? You're going to make your case harder. Pa Pavel, help me by not helping me and just listen, brother. Please, don't make it harder for me because I, then I got to correct you. John 8, 56 to 59. See, now you distracted me from reading the passages. One more time, first and last. John 8, 56 to 59. Guys, listen so you learn. I'm here to serve you and help you. Don't make it harder for me. Look at this son of Satan quoting 1 Corinthians 15, 24, 28. Tell me this guy's not a joke like his father, the devil. John 8, 56, 59. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. You see it? Unlike you, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. See, Abraham was glad to see me, unlike you. Notice their reaction. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not if yet 50 years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Man, you're not even 50. How could you have seen Abraham? You see how they understood him? They understood that Jesus saying that he saw Abraham personally to know how Abraham reacted. Did Jesus correct him and saying, No, guys, I'm not saying I saw Abraham. Come on. No, right? The son of Satan, Damien, is back because the demon in him is pricking him. The Lord Jesus rebuke you. No, I'm not saying that. Notice what Jesus says. Yes, I did see Abraham, and he did see me. And yes, I saw his reaction 2,000 years ago. You know why? John 8, 58, 59, one more time. Exactly. John 8, 58 to 59, one more time. Here's why. Watch here. We're waiting for the passages. <clears throat> Mike Jop, you got it. Be Jesus answered, then he answers him, yes. Verily, verily, I send to you, and to you. Before Abraham was born, I am. Yes, I did see Abraham, and here's why. Don't let my physical appearance mislead you. I'm much older than 50. In fact, let me tell you how old I am. Even before your father Abraham was created, I am. I was already there, and I continue to exist. Because unlike Abraham, who came into being, I am. Did you catch it? So he answers their question by saying, yes, I did actually see him. And unlike you, he was happy to see me. And you know why I was able to see him 2,000 years ago? Because unlike Abraham, who came into being, I am. I've always been and will always be. Did you catch it? That's why they took up stones to stone him. Here's my question. Here's my question. How could Adnan quote John 8, 54, ignore John 8, 39 to 40, and 56 to 59, the very chapter where Jesus says, I personally saw Abraham and he saw me. And unlike you are trying to kill me, Abraham was happy to see me. And the reason why I could see Abraham, because unlike Abraham was created, I've always been. How could he quote this chapter and ignore all this? Can you explain that to me? So unlike Abraham, who's a creature, Jesus always existed. He's contrasting Abraham's creation with his timeless existence. I'm unlike your father who had a beginning, who was created. I've always been and will always be. Only God has always been and will always be. And that's what Jesus claimed. Now, can you explain to me why Adon would quote this? And ignore John 8, 40 and John 8, 56 to 59? But it gets worse for Adnan. Let's read John 8, 23 to 24. John 8, 23 to 24. Watch here. Read with me. It gets worse. Yep. Okay. Read with me. John 8, 23, 24. And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, and... I am from above. 
You are of this world. I am not of this world. Notice, you belong to this world. I don't belong to this world because I come from above. This again, Pablo, shows you the world does not mean heaven. The world means this earth. I'm from above. You're from beneath. You're of this world. I'm not of this world. Why? And he said unto them, ye are from beneath. I am from above. Ye are of this world. I'm not of this world. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. So if Jesus is not of this world. He's from above. Where did Jesus come from? Let's go to John 8, 42. John 8, 42. John 8, 42. Watch here. Where did Jesus come from? Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. See, I came from God above into the world. So I'm not of this world. I'm from above. I came from God. So notice. Jesus says in that chapter, I came from above, from God himself, who sent me into the world. I was there before Abraham was created. And unlike Abraham was created, I've always been. And Abraham saw me and was happy. And I saw him and saw he was happy to see me. All of that in the very chapter that Adnan quoted to prove that Jesus worshipped a unipersonal God. Really? So let's ignore John 8, 23, 24. Let's ignore John 8, 40, 42. Let's ignore John 8, 56, 59. Let's focus on 54, which itself shows in John 8, 54, that the Father himself glorifies the Son. And this somehow shows that Muslims resemble Jesus more than Christians. Hmm. Interesting. But it's going to get worse. One of the 99 names of Allah, follow with me, guys. One of the 99 names of Allah is An Nur. El Nur. Guys, please don't get sidetracked on Ego Amy because that's going to entail a lengthy discussion. I don't know why you guys brought up Ego Amy. Bethy, why did you bring up Ego Amy? Because I would then have to deal with the responses to Ego Amy being a divine name, which would then mean I'd have to spend another six hours. So can we focus on what I'm, why bring up an argument that I'm not bringing up to refute him and make it harder for yourselves? Why would you do that to yourselves? I get, so, and again, I'm sorry for my brothers and sisters who may get frustrated with my frustration. I don't understand why you Christians make it harder for yourselves by bringing up irrelevant issues that do not address the point, but will make it harder for you to prove your case. Why would you do that? Ego Amy in of itself doesn't prove deity. Ego, see, now I have to explain now. You see what you did? Ego Amy, I am, the Greek words for I am, in of, in of itself does not prove deity. How do I know? Because Ego Amy is often used in context that has nothing to do with deity. For example, the blind man. In John 9 9, when they ask the blind man, Are you the blind man? He says, Ego Amy. That's what he says in the Greek, I am. Is the blind man claiming to be God? So the words ego, I me, in of themselves, do not prove deity. It's how they are used in the context. So why would you make it harder for me? Can we not focus? Help me to help you guys, honestly. Sorry you get frustrated with me. But I need to be tough with you guys. Focus. Right? With me? Are you there? Okay, so let's come back. Thanks for the distraction. Let's come back now. One of the 99 names, one of the 99 names of Allah is Al Nur. Al Nur. The light. Let's go to the Quran, chapter 24, verse 35. I know James White likes to argue the ego, Amy, but if you follow James White, God bless him, he actually shows contextually that when Jesus uses ego, Amy, he uses it the way Jehovah uses it as a divine title. He makes the case for it. Okay, exactly, Dilijan. Anyway, chapter 24, verse 35. 24, 35. One of the names of Allah is Al-Nur, the light. 
And let's post it. Our brother's going to post it. Read with me. Chapter 24, verse 35 of the Quran, picked up. Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. The similitude of his light is as a niche wherein it is a lamp. The lamp in a glass, right? Waiting for the second part, second half. Bob Pasantino was this theological intellectual giant, a spiritual giant who's now with Jesus Christ glorified in the presence of our Lord. So notice 2435 says, Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. He is the light, al nur of the heavens and the earth. The similitude, the likeness of his light, light is as a niche, wherein it is in a lamp, the lamp in a glass. We're waiting for the second part. Sorry about that. Thank our brother, first last, for posting for us, for the glory of Jesus. Okay, this lamp is kindled from a blessed tree. It's kindled from a blessed tree, and all of neither of the east nor of the west, whose oil would almost glow forth of itself, though no fire touched it, light upon light. Allah guideth unto his light whom he will, and Allah speaketh to mankind in allegories, for Allah is the knower of all things. Now, pay attention. Not only does the Quran say that Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth, according to Adnan's Salafi beliefs. There's a category of Tawheed. Tawheed is the term they coined for Islamic Unitarianism. A category of Tawheed, guys, pay attention, please. It's called Tawheed al-Asma wa Sifat. The unity, the oneness of the names and attributes of Allah. According to this category, guys, pay attention. According to this category, Allah possesses certain qualities, characteristics that cannot be ascribed to a creature. Because if you ascribe it to a creature, then you're violating Tawheed. You're committing the unforgivable sin of shirk. This category also says that the names of God cannot be ascribed to a creature in their definite form. Meaning, you cannot call someone the light with the definite article. The light. You can say he's a light, but you can't say he's the light. Okay. Now, why is that important? Billy Mandalay rushed ahead of me, but that's fine. If Jesus is like the muslims and muslims resemble jesus that means jesus knows that the light is god and if he's not god then he's not the light but in john 8 12 let us see what our lord says about himself john 8 12 the very chapter that adnan cited the very chapter that adnan cited john 8 verse 12 watch here john 8 verse 12 watch here what does our lord say Then spake Jesus unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. Bam. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. I am the light of the world that gives the light illumination that leads to life. Hold on. The Quran and Islamic theology teaches Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. He is al nur, and no creature can claim that. The very chapter. Grace Igarg wants me to humiliate and embarrass him. Grace Igarg, I'm going to humiliate you and your prophet. You just quoted Jesus saying that the disciples are the light of the world. Thank you for destroying Tawheed. Because if the disciples are the light of the world, that means your God and prophet are liars. Because the light can be given to creatures, which Tawheed says cannot. So Grace Igarg, thank you for bearing your prophet by quoting Matthew 5.14. I almost feel stupid for you. But now let's explain to Grace Ekar why Jesus could say to the disciples, you are the light of the world. He quoted Matthew 5, 14. So I want everyone to clap for Ekar for bearing Muhammad further into hell by quoting Jesus saying the disciples are the light of the world when his Quran and his theology says no one can be the light of the world except Allah. So he just deified the disciples in his stupidity. I know Muhammad was illiterate, but don't imitate his illiteracy because it ends up embarrassing you. Say, I feel stupid for you right now. Okay? But can I explain to you why Jesus could say that the disciples are the light of the world and salt of the earth? Can I show you why? Let, let me show you why. Let's go to John 9, verses 4 and 5. John 9, verses 4 to 5. Now, Grace Eckhart, tell me how stupid you feel. Come on. Honestly, you feel stupid now, right? Right. Yep, the disciples are the light, proving Muhammad was a liar and your God is a fraud. 
because you can call creatures delight, but Tawheed al Asma wa Sifat says you can't. Thank you, Grace Ikark, for bearing your God and your prophet. Thank you. John 9, 4 to 5. Let's see why Jesus could say the disciples are the light of the world. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am the world, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Now, let's go to John 12, 35 to 36. This is why Christian Prince calls these Mohammedans Abduls and Potatoes. John 12, 35 to 36. So much for being politically correct. John 12, 35 to 36. Let's read. You got to humiliate them and shame them so they can wake up to how wicked and false their religion is. Read with me. John 12, 35, 36. Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While ye have light, believe in the light, that you may be the children of the light. Bam! There's your answer. The reason why the disciples are the light of the world, because Jesus is the one who illuminates them. It's the light of Jesus shining through them. Jesus says, when you believe in me, the light, then you will have that light in you. Ouch, Grace Ikar. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. John 12, 46. Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. And as, I'm, as, I'm, as long as I'm with you, you have the light with you. So believe in the light, believe in me, and you'll be children of the light. John 12, 46. Grace Eckhart, tell me how stupid you feel, honestly. Come on, tell me, man. You've got to be feeling stupid now. I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. Did you guys catch it? Jesus says, because I'm the light of the world, when you believe in me, you'll no longer be in darkness. You'll be children of the light. You'll have the light shining through you, the light of life. Let's go back to John 8, 12 again. Don't insult donkeys, please. John 8, 12 again. Sorry for the distractions of these Mohammedans. They're only embarrassing their prophet more and more. John 8, 12. Let's read it again, which he missed. John 8, 12. Then spake Jesus again upon them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me, guys, pay attention. If you follow me, shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Bam! Did you catch it? The very verse we quoted. If you follow me, you will have my light of life in you. So why are the disciples the light of the world? Because Jesus is the light that illuminates them because they believe in him. In other words, the disciples are the moon reflecting the light of the sun. It's the light of the sun, Jesus, that's shining through them. He's the source of that light. So let me again show you how Grace Ekar just buried his prophet and his God. Number one, since Tawheed al-Asma wa Sifat says, Al-Nur is a title belonging to God and not a creature, by citing Matthew 5.14 to prove the disciples are the light of the world, he just proved that Allah is ignorant or a liar and Muhammad is ignorant or a liar because creatures can be the light of the world, so much for Tawheed al-Asma wa Sifat. So he just falsified it. Thank you. But more importantly, the reason why the disciples are the light of the world is because it's not the light they possess. It's the light of Jesus shining through them. By believing in him, Jesus' light shines in and through them. So he's the source of their light, further proving Jesus is God. And this is in John 1, 9 to 10. John 1, 9 to 10. Thank you, Grace Ekark, for helping me shame your prophet and glorify Jesus, Muhammad's God and judge. Praise Jesus Christ, our Lord. John 1, 9 to 10. You see how stupid this guy is? He just quotes 1 Timothy 6, 16, which is about, about Jesus. Grace Ekark, you want me to bounce you? Because 1 Timothy 6, 16 is about Jesus if you read 14 to 16. Matt, come on. I thought you were pretending to be stupid, but now I'm convinced you're not pretending. John 1, 9 to 10. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. The true light, 
that lightens every man, that gives light to every man, came into the world. Who's the true light? Verse 10. Verse 10. Watch here. The true light that lightens every man was coming into the world. And what does verse 10 say? Watch here. What's the delay first and last? I want you to put, put them back together now, back to back. You got to put John 1, 9 and 10 back to back. There was a delay. They want, I want them to see the connection. Do it again. John 1, 9 to 10. Sorry about that, brother. One more time, guys. Watch here. Sorry about that. Thank you, Pavel. All glory to Jesus Christ. Everything good is from him. John 1, 9 to 10. Okay, let's read together, guys. Read it. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. The true light that gives light to every man, enlightens every man, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Did you catch that, Pavel, again? He again comes into the world. Well, if heaven was part of the world, he was already in it. But guys, you see what John 1, 9 to 10 says? The reason why we have light is because that's the light of Jesus shining through us. Now, let me ask you a question. What kind of characteristics must Jesus have in order to be able to illuminate, enlighten everyone to see the truth, understand the truth, accept the truth, and walk in the truth? What kind of characteristics must Jesus have? Tell me how stupid this guy is. The light of the world can be seen. This guy actually thinks it's literally light. Grace, please. You're making Muhammad look intelligent by your stupidity. Right? Jesus must be omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, and omnipresent. Why? Because he must know who's trusting in him in order to enable every one of them to see the truth, recognize the truth, walk in the truth, and proclaim the truth. So let's sum up John 8 again. In John 8, Jesus says he's the light of the world, a title that the Quran says belongs only to God. And Jesus says he's the source of illumination who enlightens and illuminates everyone. In John 8, Jesus says he's from above, not from the world, not from below, and came from God into the world. Jesus says that Abraham saw him and he saw Abraham personally face to face because unlike Abraham who's created, Jesus has always existed, always been. This is the very chapter that Adnan tried to quote to prove that Jesus and Muslims are similar in their worship of God. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? Now let me tell you how desperate Muslims get in John 8, 58. Hey, admins, can you bound some of these guys and ban them? Come on, guys, I made you an admin to help me out because we got sons of Satan, wicked trolls that want attention that shouldn't be here. I don't want to leave my page and ban him because I want to lose the connection. Okay, now let's go back to John 8, 58. Let's answer an objection to John 8, 58. Not only hidden, you, uh, you unhit him now, first and last. Bounce him. Right. Yeah, and get rid of grace too. Bounce these guys. John 8, 58. Let's look at the objection again. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I sent to you before Abraham was I am. The objection that Adnan brought up is that, yes, Jesus existed in God's mind before Abraham was born. Jesus existed in God's mind before Abraham was born. That's what he means. Now, are you ready for me to refute that? Understand the objection. Jesus existed in God's mind before Abraham was born. That's all Jesus is saying. Okay. Are you ready for me to refute that? Are you ready now for the answer? Adnan says what Jesus meant is that he existed in the mind of God before Abraham was born. Two responses. Number one, if Jesus meant he existed in the mind of God before Abraham was created, Abraham also existed in God's mind. So at no sense... At no time was Jesus before Abraham because Abraham and Jesus both existed in the mind of God. You see what a stupid argument that is? How can Jesus say, 
I was in the mind of God before Abraham was born, when Abraham was also in God's mind before Abraham was born. That's the first response. The second response is that that ignores the context. What's the context? John 8, 57, 58. That's the context. In 8, 57, 58, they're wondering, how could you have seen Abraham? They asked Jesus, you've seen Abraham? You're not 50 years old? And the response is, yes, I saw him because unlike Abraham, I was there. So they have to ignore why Jesus said what he said in verse 58. Jesus' answer is in response to the challenge and the objection. You're not yet 50 years old. Hast thou seen Abraham? And he says, yes, I did. Because don't let my physical appearance mislead you. I'm much older than 50. I was around before Abraham was created because unlike Abraham, who has a beginning, I've always been. That's why he says what he says. Yeah, I did see him because I was around even back then and I was there even before he was born. You see how silly that objection is? You see how silly that objection is? Oh, but it gets even better. We're not even done yet. It gets even better. You guys know the story of John 7, 53 to 8, 11, right? What that story is all about? Let me sum it up. Because I want to finish it with John 7, 53 to 8, 11. Lord willing, I got part four tomorrow. John 7, 53 to 8, 11. Okay. It's a story of the woman caught in adultery. Yeah, in fact, like this, blow it up. John 7, 53 to 8, 11. Okay, let me explain what the context is. The Jews bring a woman caught in adultery before Jesus. And they ask Jesus, what should we do to the woman? Okay, don't forget the context. They bring the woman caught in adultery to Jesus. And they want Jesus to pass judgment. If Jesus said stone her, then they could report him to the Romans, saying that he's now inciting the cr crowds to sedition by taking the law into their own hands because the Jews had no right to kill anyone. But if he said, don't stone her, then they could use that as a charge against him saying, look, he goes against the law of Moses. He's a false prophet. You see what they're trying to do? They're trying to set up Jesus, right? They're trying to set up Jesus, correct? John 7, 53 to 8, 11, right? They're trying to set up Jesus. Jesus, here's a woman caught in adultery. If you say stone her, we're going to report you to the Romans, get you in trouble for inciting us to take the law into our own hands because we can't kill anybody. But if you say don't kill her, then you're breaking the law of Moses and you're a false prophet because no true prophet goes against Moses. Okay, now, if you understand the context, yes, because they're under Roman jurisdiction. John 18, 31. Pavel asked me the question. Let me show you. John 18, 31. John 18 through 1, then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. We can't put him to death. You know that, Pilate. That's why we came to you. John 18, 31, right? You got it? Okay, now, if you got the context, put a 1. If you got the context, put a 1. Because I'm going to show you something. Just put a one before I move on. Icing on the cake. Marianne, you're serious? Think about it. Is it lawful for someone, for a person in the street to shoot someone? Can I go into your neighbor and shoot you dead? Is that lawful, Marion? Before I do that, yeah, I don't know why it says keep showing. Show. I just want Marion to answer. Do I have the right to go in the street and shoot you dead for no reason? Okay. But doesn't it happen all the time, Marion? Don't people shoot and kill each other all the time against the law? Just because Jews wanted to stone Jesus doesn't mean that was lawful for them to do so. So why are you confusing the Jews who in a fit of rage and anger are breaking the law by trying to kill Jesus, something that was unlawful, and then somehow assuming 
That means they have the right to put people to death. Don't confuse the two. Right? Is that clear? Did we get the point? We got the point. Okay, now that we got the point, the Jews bring an adulterous woman to set up Jesus. Okay, now let's go to Exodus 31.18. Exodus 31 18. Rob Daly, I, th I thought I just explained it makes no sense. Why would you ask me if I agree? You're killing me, Rob. Exodus 31 18. Read with me, guys. Don't lose focus. Read with me. And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. We're told that God wrote the laws of Moses with his finger. God wrote the laws, the commandments with his finger. What laws? The laws that include the punishment for adulterers, right? Did you see that in Exodus 3, 18? With the finger of God. Deuteronomy 9, 10. Deuteronomy 9, 10. Deuteronomy 9, 10. Watch here. Deuteronomy 9.10. Watch what happens here. And the Lord Jehovah delivered unto me two tablets of stone, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. And on them was written according to all the words which Jehovah the Lord spake with you in the mount out of the midst of the fire in the day of assembly. Did you catch it? Did you catch it? Jehovah wrote the commandments for Moses, which included the punishment for adulterers with the finger of God. God's finger, right? God's finger, right? The finger of God wrote the laws of Moses, including the punishment for adultery, correct? Did you get it? Guys, don't miss this because I've shared this in the past. First last has heard it, but I want you to catch it. Okay. Jeremiah 17 13 watch this guys you got to pay attention Revelation 22 13 if you haven't heard this before Because I've shared in the past This is gonna blow you away. I guarantee you it's gonna blow you away You're gonna sit in awe of how real Jesus is how awesome our God is and how amazing the Bible is okay Jeremiah 17 13 wait blatant don't don't rain on our prey Jeremiah 17 13 be patient All credit and glory to the triune God May crucify our flesh. Okay? Jeremiah 17, 13. Watch here. O Jehovah, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, all who turn their backs on thee. And they that depart from thee shall be written in the earth. Those who depart, turn their backs on you, you'll write them in the earth. Because they have forsaken Jehovah, the fountain of living waters. Notice, all who oppose Jehovah and turn their backs on him, turn away from him, you will write them in the earth. Because he is the fountain of living waters. Fountain of living waters. Jehovah wrote the commandments of Moses, including the punishment of adultery with the finger of God. He is the fountain of living waters, and he'll write the names of his enemies on the earth, in the earth. Okay. John 8, 6 to 8. Let's see if you make the connection. John chapter 8, verses 6 to 8. Watch here. John 8, verses 6 to 8. Watch here. Read. This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stopped down, stooped down, and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Jesus wrote with his finger on the ground in response to those who, are, who don't believe in him, who have turned their backs on him, who have turned away from him, who reject him. He wrote on the ground with his finger. But Jehovah says he'll write the names of his enemies on the earth because he's the father of living waters. And Jehovah wrote the commandments of Moses with the finger of God. Now let's go to John 7, 38 to 39. 
Dennis, that calls for a bounce. You know that, right? Who told you it's not authentic? James White? Right? John 7, 38, 39. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So if you believe in Jesus, he'll give you rivers of living water. But Jehovah is the source of the fountain of life, the waters of life. But this spake he of the spirit, which they that believeth on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Wait, wait, wait. Jehovah is the source of living waters, the waters of life. Yet believing in Jesus gives you the water of life. Jehovah will write the, the names of his enemies who turn away from him on the earth. And Jehovah wrote the commands of Moses with his finger. Jesus stoops down and writes on the ground with his finger. Because John wants you to see that the Jehovah of the Old Testament who wrote the laws of Moses with his finger. Who will write the names of his enemies on the ground who is the source of the waters of life, is none other than Jesus Christ in the flesh. And what's the context of Jesus writing on the ground with his finger? An issue having to do with the law of Moses, adultery. This is the same chapter that Adnan quoted to prove that Muslims are like Jesus and that they worship a unipersonal God. Did you catch it? Did you catch it? Yes, because the waters of life is the Holy Spirit that will indwell us and fill us and preserve us and sustain us, something that only God can do. The connection by just recalling passages from the Old Testament and connecting with the new, new by the grace of God's Holy Spirit. So God gets the glory. And I'm not the first to discover this. Many have discovered this over the centuries. Okay, now let me explain why when Jesus said, he who's without sin, cast the first stone. And no one took him up on that charge. Why didn't someone in defiance of Jesus say, you know what? I would out sin and throw a stone. Have you ever wondered why they all walked away? Notice it says one by one, they walked away. When Jesus said, if you're without sin, cast the first stone. Do you know why? Not, not one of them opposed Jesus and said, you know what? The heck with that, I'm going to do it. I'm without sin. Do you know why? Does anyone know why? Thank you. Cue the one got it. For them to know that the woman was, was an adulteress, they must know the man she committed adultery with. And according to Deuteronomy 22, you have to bring the man and the woman to be stoned. They only brought the woman, not the man. Well, the only way they could know that the woman committed adultery is if they knew whom she committed adultery with. So they must have known the man. By not bringing the man, they're already breaking the law of Moses. That was Jeremiah 17, 13, Vine 101. So by bringing the woman, not the man, they were already breaking the law of Moses. They were already in sin, and they knew it. That's why in their shame, they walked away. After all, how did you know she committed adultery? The only way I know that you committed adultery is if I know the person you committed adultery with. So where's the man? By not bringing the man, they're already guilty of breaking the law, showing they could care less about the law. They had no concern for the law, and they knew they got caught. So Jesus is Jehovah God of Moses, who wrote the law of Moses with his own finger. Jesus is the Jehovah God of Jeremiah, who would write the names of his enemies on the earth and is the source of living waters, the fountain of life. And that's all in John 8 and John 7, 38 to 39. And in John 8, Jesus is the light of the world, a title that Islam 
recognizes belongs only to God. And John 8, Jesus is not from the world. He's from above. He's from the Father. He came from the Father, from above, entered the world. Abraham saw him personally, and he saw Abraham personally. And Abraham rejoiced at seeing him. And the reason why Jesus could see Abraham, who had been dead 2,000 years at that time, is because unlike Abraham, who was created, Jesus has always ex existed and was there even before Abraham lived. And it's the same John 8, 54, where Jesus says, Your God is my Father, and he glorifies me. All of that in John 8, how dare Adnan quote John 8 to prove that Jesus is not God in the flesh, one with the Father in essence, glory, power, majesty, and honor, but that he resembles Muslims more than he resembles Christians. Is that amazing or what? With that said, folks, this session is done. Lord Jesus willing, I got part four tomorrow. So Lord Jesus willing, part four tomorrow, same bat time, same bat channel, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm going to be teaching every day of this week because Lord willing, Lord Jesus willing, I'm leaving on the 12th, May 12th to the 19th with a group of Christians headed by a pastor. We're going to go through several states. Preaching, teaching, evangelizing. So pray for our traveling mercies. Pray for our protection. Pray the Lord Jesus will keep my two angels, my daughters, perfectly safe as I travel and provide for their needs. And prayerfully consider if you want to support this trip and upcoming events and the ministry in general. The links to my Patreon pages are in the description box and the PayPal account. The fastest way to give is PayPal. <clears throat> if the Lord puts in your heart, it'd be a blessing to contribute to our trip, to our expenses as we travel this week. And to let you know, July 13 and 14 in Florida, I'm debating a oneness heretic, a pastor who is a oneness heretic who worships a false god. We're having a two-day debate on the nature of the Trinity. Pray Jesus fills me with the spirit for that debate to decimate his lies, destroy his arguments, and expose his false god with the hopes that him and his congregation will repent. July 13 and 14, the de details of which are on my Facebook pages. So keep praying for us. No, she did commit adultery, medic. Who said she didn't? You're not getting it, medic. Let me try it again. She was caught in adultery, but to their shame, they didn't bring the man. They only brought the woman because they could care less about the law. And Jesus exposed them. Full preterism, Aramaic Chaldean Catholic Church is a heresy. Any view that denies that Jesus will return physically, bodily from heaven is a heresy not taught in Scripture. It goes against Scripture. So pray for us. Pray for the ministry and consider supporting my upcoming travel by contributing to our pages. The fastest way is PayPal. And do pray for my angels that God will sustain them and provide for them through me and provide for me to do full-time ministry because this is what I do, folks. David Wood, Christian Prince, and I, we're all in full-time ministry. So we depend on the grace of God to provide for us for his glory. Right? Remember, Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Come sooner than later. Wash us in your blood. Wash my daughters in your blood. Seal us by your spirit. Preserve us in your love to be more in love with you and save us from our sinfulness, from the world, its influence, and from Satan. And keep us in love with you, Lord Jesus. And please provide for us, Lord. Forgive me for any mistakes I made, for being unnecessarily offensive. Anything good came from you, Lord Jesus. Strengthen those truths in our hearts to affirm them and to love you more passionately. Because we love you, Son of God. You are worthy. You are risen. You are alive. You are real. And you dwell in our hearts by your spirit. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Lord willing, see you tomorrow. 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, if the Lord Jesus wills. Take care. Lord bless. He's risen, risen indeed.